KITCO News special coverage of the 31st Global Metals and Mining Conference is brought to you by Gold Terra. I'm Michelle McCory, and you are watching KITCO News coming to you from the Bank of Montreal Global Metals and Mining Conference. My next guest says that carbon credits will inevitably be one of the most widely held assets on the planet. Brett Heath is the chairman of Carbon Neutral Royalty. He is also the CEO and president of Metella Royalty and Streaming. Brett, good to have you with us. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks for having me. All right, Brett, that is a pretty big statement. You say that carbon credits are an emerging and fast-growing asset class that will inevitably rival stocks, bonds, and real estate. Qualify that for me. Well, what we're seeing right now is we're seeing an asset class that was really uh, created by the global politicians around the world to fight climate change. And what they did was they put it in the hands of the private markets. And this was probably the best thing that they could ever do. They've been trying to fight this problem for decades and decades and decades without really any success. And they pushed this new asset class by creating really the demand for it. What happened was is that over the last year, the, now these carbon credits have been around for about two decades. So they're not a new, they're not a new asset class, but they are new in the, in the means that they first time we've ever seen mass adoption. And they've done this through uh, putting pressure really on major, the, the largest major public and private corporations around the world to adopt these carbon neutral mandates. And once they adopt these carbon neutral mandates, then they have to follow them. Well, look, the climate change agenda has been dominating many, many, many sectors. The whole notion of uh, decarbonization. Whether you like it or not, it's really become uh, a very integral part in so many sectors going forward and presently. What is the current size of the market for carbon credits, though? It's clearly a growing market, but where does the current market stand? In 2021, the total dollar amount of carbon credits that traded was just over a billion. And we expect this market to see the trillions of dollars. So it's very, very early uh, in, this, in this phase. A multi-trillion dollar market. I think it's going to be a multi-trillion dollar market. By when? Well, it's probably... It's tough to say exactly, but it's probably the next 10, 20 years, we're gonna see very, very significant growth. Okay. And the, re the reason why this is, is because it applies to everybody. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or you don't. Every plane ticket you buy, every nice meal that you have out at a restaurant, anything that you do uh, is going to, this is going to be incorporated into your daily life as a cost. Right. Uh, because these corporations, countries all the way down to, you know, the individuals are going to be responsible for covering their footprint. Well, in the meantime, it's it's voluntary. Speaking of buying a plane ticket, I've noticed that when I buy plane tickets, depending on which country I'm buying those tickets in, mm -hmm. it says, would you like to offset your carbon footprint by <laughs> buying a carbon credit? It's voluntary on that angle. But we're going to break that down in a little bit. You say that this is a multi-trillion dollar asset class. It's going to hit that in the next decade or so. You have had considerable success in forecasting big macro trends through your work with Nova and Metella. So, so break that down for us, how your past experience has uh, proven to be mm -hmm. potentially a, a harbinger for this one. Yeah, well, what, what we like to do is we like to find very long-term macro trends and we build companies around these macro trends and we use the royalty and streaming model as our means to be able to give investors the best way to be able to profit or get exposure to these asset classes in these trends. And so with Metalla, that was the monetary cycle. Uh, with Nova, this, that was the energy transition. That was for copper and nickel, the two critical elements in the energy transition. And how have you done with Nova? And they've done, they've done great. We've been one of the most active royalty companies uh, in both uh, energy transition and precious metals. We've completed upwards of 40 acquisitions. Um, we've deployed over uh, combined about $300 million. Uh, and uh, and they've worked out you know, very, very successfully over the years. How's it worked out for your shareholders? Oh, it's worked out great too. Uh, Metalla, we did our first public financing 
uh, when we started that company at a dollar twenty Canadian, so about a dollar US or so, and it reached a high of about sixteen fifty Canadian or about thirteen US. So that was over about five and a half year period. We generated a forty still today, even with the consolidation that we've had with this gold market, we still have generated a forty two percent compound annual growth rate. That means if you bought the stock in the beginning and held it to today, yeah. your average return every year is about 42%. It's a pretty healthy return. Okay, so yeah. now we've qualified that you do know what you're talking about, at least some of the time. <laughs> so let's bring it back to carbon credits and break it down for our viewers that really don't understand the market at all yet. What exactly is a carbon credit? In the most simple terms, a carbon credit equals one ton of carbon removed from either removed or avoided from the atmosphere. So uh, there's there's tons of different types of projects. Uh, there's technology based solutions. There is uh, energy, renewable energy based solutions. And then there's nature based solutions. And each one of these categories has another 10, 12, 13. I mean, it, it, they continue to go up as there's different ways to do this. So, so uh, give me an example of how a carbon credit is created. So where we focus on our business is in the nature-based solution segment and primarily on, on restoration or reforestation. And what we're doing is we're restoring environments. We're planting trees and based on the amount of trees that are in a certain area that have been cut down in the past uh, and based on how much carbon those trees will pull out, it equals one credit. So every single year, once those trees are planted, <clears throat> we get issued credits. Now, that has to go through a very long, complicated process from, right. from the very beginning to when they're verified and issued. But basically, you plant a tree, you get a credit because it pulls out carbon from the air. Correct. And then somebody else can buy that credit, which in a way gives them a license to pollute, to offset the pollution that they may be creating with uh, their operations. That's correct. It brings it to zero. And, and really the thought process the thought process around this is we've been living off fossil fuels for the last century. And there was no really clear way to immediately transition. This is going to be a two, three, four decade process. Uh, so the carbon credits and really this asset class that again, the global, the global, global group of politicians created by creating demand for these things, um, it, it allows you to have that bridge. It allows companies to be able to do something where they're not, they're carbon neutral in regards to their own inputs. And it allows them until their businesses are carbon neutral themselves, which will take a long time to get to. Get okay, to. So say for example, I have an operation that requires a fleet of 20 trucks that are mm -hmm. still running on gas mm -hmm. in order to eliminate or reduce the uh, carbon footprint of that operation, I go and buy some carbon credits from you because you've just planted some trees and that's pulling out some carbon from the air. It very simplistically, yes. Okay. Yes, one, one ton of carbon removed by various activities or one ton of carbon created and that, that neutralizes. This, this is the voluntary part of the market. I just Correct. want to briefly touch on a little bit the involuntary part of the market because this whole thing started, I believe in the 90s with the Kyoto Protocol and the whole cap and trade system that this whole notion of trying to reduce carbon footprints began. Mm -hmm. Just break that down for us a little. Sure, so the, the compliance market is a highly regulated market and that's usually fixed prices by the government and it's usually focused on certain industries where if, if there are two big energy companies and one is below the limit, they could sell their balance of credits to one that's over the limit to create a limit for the whole or really a cap on that whole industry. And this is completely different than the voluntary market. And that's what, that's what viewers really need to understand. The voluntary market um, is something that people voluntarily commit to. Now, What's important is that the 3,000 plus largest public and private companies around the world, when they incorporate into their ESG policies that they are going to be carbon neutral by 2030, 2040, 2050, yeah. it's no longer voluntary for them. They need to commit to these or the largest pools of capital around the world 
are not going to want to own their stock. So it's voluntary in the sense that they choose to do it. It's not mandatory from Correct. a government perspective, but it's not voluntary in the sense that it's what you're saying institutional shareholders demand in exactly. terms of being ESG compliant. And this is the demand. This is just the start of the demand, by the way. Um, the demand is going to be much bigger than this. But this is really the start of the demand today that's driving the prices higher. And by this demand or this demand creation, by driving the prices higher, it is allowing now companies like ours and many, many, many others to go put real capital into these projects that go into the environment that are going to do tremendous things. Okay, so I'm a car manufacturer, for example, but I've given uh, an ESG compliant pledge to my shareholders who are big institutional investors who really care about ESG, but I can't hamper my operations in a way at the moment that meets that target. Mm -hmm. So again, I come to you or to the uh, carbon credit market and buy some licenses to pollute, if, if you will, or to continue doing the operations that I need to do that aren't that environmentally friendly, Correct. but then I'm doing some good. I'm detracting from the carbon that I'm putting out there by mm -hmm. buying something that then uh, neutralizes it. Exactly. And, and again, this is the bridge to carbon zero because it's going to take a long time, a long time, decades for these businesses to be able to bring their to be able to bring their operations to a place where there's carbon neutral. There still needs to be advancements in technology and renewable energy. And the 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 really the reality is it's not ready for for okay. that yet. So the the bridge is really these carbon credits that are gonna allow them to continue on and, and manage that in a in a very reasonable process. Well that brings a number of questions to mind. Mm -hmm. Firstly, how is this regulated? Who's to say that your carbon credits are legit and that they are acceptable way for me to offset my carbon footprint? So right now, uh, there are a few uh, third party registration groups that, that are the ones that do all of the verification. Um, and it's a very long, complicated process. It usually takes about three years to do. There's a lot of technical studies you have to put forward. You have to be able to prove not only that your project will do what it says, but then every single year, as it produces more credits, it needs to be audited, or at least every single time that the verification agencies issue those credits. So right now, there are a few. They do have different processes and different protocols in regards to these types of credits, and the credits trade at different prices. That's another really important thing to understand. But is, is there, before we get into the prices, is there an international oversight um, is there an international regulatory body that is sort of oversees all of this at the moment? You mentioned private companies, but is there a big oversight committee or body or regulatory authority that comes and says, okay, I verify that you have planted X number of trees and that these X number of trees uh, do X, Y, and Z to neutralize the, the, the carbon offset? Is this, there is no current body that's overseeing all of this at the moment, correct? There's, there's the, the, the body that's driving this is really from the United Nations, but there's no global standard. There's no global regulatory standard yet. There will be. This is, again, this is an early market. Think about, think about crypto when there were no exchanges. Well, we're still waiting yeah. for real regulation on, on, on crypto. On exactly, yeah. exactly. But I mean, there's hundreds of exchanges now, or yeah. maybe not hundreds, but there's lots of different ways to exchange and they're liquid and they're transparent. Um, 10 years ago, you had to meet someone in a coffee shop with a USB stick to get it. It's literally that early today for the carbon sector. And that's why that's the opportunity, I suppose. This is the opportunity. So we don't know. And the reality is that nobody really knows exactly what the market's going to look like. Um, we're all watching it and we're all uh, investing it. What we do know is that we do know that this is a real asset class and it's emerging and it's not going away. And it's going to be so big because it applies to everybody. Everybody. How does it apply to everybody? Everybody has a carbon footprint. If you have any activity, if you go what to the mall. What if I don't care that I have a carbon footprint? The company is I personally, I don't care yeah. that I drove my car here uh -huh. and I don't get bothered by my carbon footprint. 
well, the, the Coca-Cola that you drink or the, um, you know, clothes that you buy or the nice restaurant that you eat at, everything in your entire life, eventually these companies will pass the costs on. So right now you mentioned on your flight, there was an option for you to offset your carbon footprint on that flight. If you want to pay an extra five or 10 or $15, whatever it is for the, the carbon footprint. This is just the start of it. Eventually that won't be an option. Eventually it'll just be part of the cost, just like the TSA charge that, that was created and has never gone away. So all of this will be implemented. So that, that's what I mean, even whether you want to be a part of it or not, it will be uh, a, an additional cost for you in all of your activities that you participate in. Um, in so I may as well find a way to profit from it, is what exactly. you're saying. And I'm not saying I don't care about my carbon footprint, just using that as a hypothetical example over here. So let's talk about prices, because how are these uh, current carbon credits priced and what is um, the, the scale, the, the, the range of prices for carbon credits? So there, there's, there's voluntary prices that are quoted today. I mean, I, they've been around kind of the 11, 12, 13, 14 range recently. But what we've noticed is that not... So at one carbon credit, which eliminates one ton of carbon dioxide from the air, is that correct, correct. costs me $11? It, it, it changes, right? But in, in that range is where it's been. Now, what we've noticed is that the, the voluntary market actually has a much broader spread of pricing. Um, we've seen pricing um, on certain types of projects, certain types of applications, trade five, six, seven dollars a credit, all the way up to 30, 34, 30, and mid $30 range. So what one ton is one ton across all the applications, as long as they've been verified by one of the accredited groups that verify these carbon credits. There's Vera, there's Gold Standards, there's a few others that do this. Um, so one ton is still one ton from a verification perspective. The reason why some credits trade higher than others is because of the additionalities, the co-benefits, the biodiversity benefits that are involved, <clears throat> excuse me, with this project. So if you're just doing a direct air removal of a ton of carbon, that's fantastic using a big machine, but there's no really co-benefits. It's not really helping anybody else. It's removing a ton out of the atmosphere. But if you're focused on nature-based solutions, you can make a huge impact, not only to the environment, to the biodiversity, all of the different species that return. You know, we see on a lot of our projects that we're investing in, like fish stocks double, um, significant community benefits. I mean, what you're doing is you're providing long-term sustaining um, eco-friendly jobs from ones that were basically destroying the environment. And, the, and a lot of these are in frontier markets rural communities and it's their livelihood. So it's it's really interesting. It's So you're it, creating a, a number of uh, ESG benefits depending on the project. But before we get yeah. specifically to your company, just help me understand the exchange aspect. Where are carbon credits currently being traded and exchanged? So most of the credits today are traded through brokers. Okay. There, there's, there, are, there are a lot of exchanges that are in the works. Um, I would say none that really have full adoption yet, uh, but there are a lot of exchanges in the works. We hear a lot about them. Um, we do think that they're needed, um, but right now um, it's really kind of a black box type situation where you've got brokers uh, that deal with the project developers and they get the credits and then they sell them off to uh, the different corporations that need to offset their, their footprint. And uh, I'm assuming that this is an opportunity that's just ripe for blockchain and tokenizing these credits. There is a very big opportunity. And, and look, we're, you know, we'll, we're looking at this. I mean, it's, it's not exactly part of our business, but, um, but it will be transparent. The market will be transparent. Um, the amount of capital that's coming into the sector right now, um, I mean, I've, I've rarely seen anything like it before. And again, we're, it's so small right now. Okay, so let's focus on carbon neutral royalty. Give yeah. me the give me the overview of what you guys are doing. Well, coming from the background of the royalty and streaming business, we wanted to use that approach. It's such a the royalty and streaming structure is such a uh, 
incredible way to give investors exposure because you get exposure at the asset level and you get the the benefits or really the leverage of rising prices. It's 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 a it's a vehicle that that can can significantly um, give you a number of different things to to profit. Now, when we looked at the business, we realized we couldn't approach it just as a royalty and streaming company. And so what we've done is we've built really a full ecosystem. And as the financing partner within the ecosystem, we're financing the developers. We're bringing in the distribution groups on the tech side, on the procurement side. We're bringing in other groups on the implementation side. And we're building a full ecosystem um, that really solves the problem from start to finish. Okay, but when you say you're financing projects, what exactly are you financing? I read in your presentation that you're financing mangroves. You're paying for people to to plant mangroves. It's- that's correct. That's correct, and it's that's also an important so uh, an important point. When we looked, when we approached this business, we looked, we dissected every single part of the carbon credit segment the technology base, the renewable energy, and the nature base. And we looked at really the economic productivity and the cost structure of all of these different applications. And one that was that we found was head and shoulders above everything else was blue carbon. And now blue carbon is any carbon derived from really anything that touches water. The biggest part of it is mangroves, but you have seagrass, you have kelp, you have wetlands, you have other, other parts. And the reason is, is because blue carbon or really mangroves and another, you know, other blue carbon, it, they're the largest carbon sinks in the world. They store the carbon in the sediments that stores for millennia rather than decades or maybe a century, what, what you typically get with forest. The productivity of mangroves on the amount of carbon that it sequesters is up to 10 times more productive than forest, whether it's pine, eucalyptus, teak, you know, and so forth. Um, At the same time, the planting cost is only about a third. So if, if, if you're, we're, you know, most of these companies are in the mining business here today. And if you're in the mining business, there are some very, very well-known mines, the blue carbon, the mangroves are the Fosterville's or the gold strikes or the Cortez's of the carbon industry. And so not all carbon credits are created equally is, is what you're telling me. Exactly. And not only are they more productive but they trade at much higher premiums. Uh, we've seen some credits trade recently from our uh, exclusive uh, partner, which we can talk about in a little bit, um, on the developer side of Blue Carbon, trade as high as $34 a ton. So mangroves are especially environmentally friendly and do extra carbon offsetting. Okay, so what exactly is your company doing with mangroves and your financing for them to be planted around the globe, break that down for us. That's correct. So what, what we do is we've partnered with the largest blue carbon developer in the world. Um, one of the most experienced group, it's a Norwegian group called Worldview International Foundation. They've been around since 1979. They've been doing this well before, uh, before there were carbon credits, before it ever existed. Uh, and they've done successfully over 600 projects around the world in 25 different countries. So we wanted to find the best blue carbon developer that we could partner with. And these, these developers are foundations. They're structured as nonprofits. And they've been, they've been saving the world on donations, on grants and subsidies. That's how they've been able to do this over the last 40 years. Uh, we wanted to help them fast track their goals. Uh, because these developers can really make a dramatic impact if they didn't have that capital problem. The, the politicians really cr- did that for them. They created this new revenue stream, this new asset class that solved the capital problem for them. And so we can partner with them. We finance the planting of, or restoration is what we do with the mangroves. These are areas that were cut down, abandoned shrimp farms, um, thousands of hectares. I mean, we've seen this, I was visiting a project not too long ago. I mean, these areas inside uh, these mangrove forests, I mean, it's desert because these shrimp farms just degraded the whole entire area. Well, what are the geographic areas that we're talking about now? So the Saudi Arabia of blue carbon is Southeast Asia. That's about 50% of the world's... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
I mean, for oil, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For well, I, yeah. I get the metaphor, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm just trying to say just something with so so much size where it holds all of the, the assets in this sector for at least the blue carbon segment on the mangroves that were uh, really making it a focus of our business is Southeast Asia. And then there's another 20, 25% in Central America and the Caribbean. And then the rest is kind of spread out across you know Africa, Northern Australia and, and the like. So by financing the planting of these mangroves, mm -hmm. you, your company then creates the carbon credit that you intend to then sell elsewhere? Is that the business model? Yeah, so we, we finance the projects. The projects, as they grow, produce a different vintage of credits every year. So here's the best part about it. When you, when you plant, let's say you plant 10,000 hectares of mangroves. Every single year, these things grow. And every single year, based on the size of the project and the amount of carbon that that project will sequester, you get issued a different vintage. And when you're doing restoration- It's issued by whom? Issued by the verification agencies, the verification groups. Which are still private groups that aren't necessarily the official global body that's at some point gonna step in here, right? Well, we'll see. I mean, we'll see. They do a phenomenal job so far. I mean, they've got a really tough job to do. I think they're doing their absolute best. And I think they're evolving very, very fast on making sure that uh, the projects that are there um, are real and that they will do what they say they'll do. Um, two, three years ago, four years ago, when these prices were trading at one, two dollars a credit, it really, there was really no revenue stream there. So these, you know, it was a much different situation when they were a lot of times just trying to keep the projects alive till today. Um, and so we do see this continuing to evolve. Do you get a credit just for planting uh, a tree or planting a mangrove, or is it a, a continuing credit um, as uh, maintenance occurs? I mean, what, what, what creates the credit? Has that been worked out yet? Well, no, the, the credit has been worked out and it one credit equals one ton, either remove or avoid it. Okay. So, so, so based on the project and how big it is and how many tons of carbon that it's sequestering a year for, for, for our projects, that's the amount of credits that you get. And then so every single year you get a different vintage. How many tons does, um, I don't, what is the average size of, a, of, of the macro that you plant? So our first, our first uh, acquisition, we've got a little over 100,000 hectares of restoration that we're going to be planning on, on restoring. Okay, so how many tons of carbon does 100,000 hectares of mangroves offset per year or per day? Whichever stats you yeah, have on hand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what I can say is just from a bigger picture, uh, these mangrove trees, the life of them are usually about 30 years. So when you do one of these projects, you're giving exposure to carbon credits that will be produced for the next three decades. So this is why it's exciting, because what we're doing is we're trying to give investors ex price exposure. Um, at the same time, we're providing capital for these developers to clean up literally coastlines of countries. I mean, it's pretty incredible. But um, every, single, every single year, as these projects advance, um, they, they pull out more carbon. For 30 years on 100,000 hectares, we expect approximately uh, about 70 million credits okay. for, for carbon neutral. And then the other 70 million credits goes back into the communities. It creates programs for medical, uh, for, the, for other biodiversity, socioeconomic programs, um, schools, and so forth. So just to crystallize all of this, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of complicated concepts that we've touched mm -hmm. on here, buying a share of carbon neutral royalty, what does that get me now? What, what, what am I exposed to? So what, what we're trying to give investors is we're trying to give investors exposure to really the premium segment of the carbon sector. We're giving them 30 years of price exposure. So when we finance these projects, we're financed, we're basically planting them at a certain cost. And so just like a streaming agreement, uh, you've got a certain cost and that is your cost of those credits being produced for the next 30 years. And so we're locking in that cost at the upfront level. 
and our, our, our investors and our shareholders will get exposure for the next three decades on the most premium segment in the carbon sector, which is blue carbon. And at the moment, uh, where does the status of the company stand? It's a private company. Where are you up to right now with this venture? Yes, we are a private company right now. Um, we've, we've just announced our first two acquisitions, our first two announcements, which is the Worldview International Foundation partnership. You know, we're very pleased that they chose us to be their exclusive financing partner. Like I said, they're one of the biggest, best, most experienced in the world at implementing these things. And then we also just announced another partnership with a company out of London called Abatable. And Abatable is part of our distribution ecosystem. So they not only help people figure out what their carbon footprint is. That was one of your questions earlier. How do I figure out what my carbon footprint is? You can go to their website, you can put in all the information, and they'll tell you what your carbon footprint is. And that goes from big corporations all the way down to individuals. Um, but what they do is provide distribution. So distribution, again, is another key component and you need to have the whole ecosystem covered. And so we're again, partnering with what we believe are the best, the best tech, the best developers, all of the best parts of that ecosystem, we're pulling them all into one company, focusing on the most premium segment of the market. And we wanna give investors exposure to that over the next 30, 40, 50 years through these, through these asset classes. That's too far in the future for me, personally. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a projection of where this asset class will be in the next five years? Yeah, I mean, In terms of market size and scope. I mean, it's tough to say exactly how fast it's going to grow. I mean, we're just, we're seeing it grow rapidly. I mean, I, I think we're easily going to see it grow, you know, 100% a year, potentially for, for a number of years. Um, but there's a lot of investment. It does take a, a little while to move these projects that are um, in development to production. It takes, like I said, it takes about three years to, to, to really from start to finish to get a project verified. But the carbon credit market at large, where do you see that in five years time in terms of size and scope and um, prevalence? Yeah, I think, I think we could see the carbon market in the next five to 10 years easily reach 100 billion. And that's 100 times what it was last year. That's where we're going. And as we get further along, um, that market's going to increase. But where else can you find a market that has that type of growth um, with that type of demand? And there's also the feel good element that you're supposedly doing something good for the planet well, as well. Well, it's <clears throat> look, the, the, the politicians did the right thing here because they they're pretty nobody ever says that Brett. The i know politicians did know. the right thing for I mean, once that's a very rare statement for, for, to for once for once they did the right thing because they put this in the hands of the private sector okay okay so they're they did the right thing by not doing anything putting it in the hands of the private sector which is what they should do with with everything right the private sector does everything much better and the private sector will when when there's when there's a business there and it just in fact significantly helps. I mean, this is, like I said, some of the projects that we're looking at, that we're looking at that we are going to be planting could literally change the whole dynamic of a country's coastline. It's, it's really incredible. And not just that, but just the, the people, the communities and everything else that it goes into. It's, it's incredibly impactful. Okay. Coming from a world of mining, obviously, and resources. I mean, we're on the royalty side, but. All right. Well, yeah. Brett, you have planted the seed, pun yep. intended for this topic and for this conversation. And as it grows and develops, we will definitely check back in with you, not only about your company, but how the asset class itself is doing. So thank you so much for breaking that down for us. Brett, appreciate it. Perfect, thanks Michelle. Kitco News special coverage of the 31st Global Metals and Mining Conference is brought to you by Gold Terra.